Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. We are called to genuinely prepare our hearts. You know, one of the things that, that we do in a school system is we practice and prepare for the worst. We have fire drills. We have intruder drills. We have all kinds of drills multiple times throughout each semester. Why do we do that? So that the children are prepared. And not just the children, so that the teachers and the staff are prepared. They're genuinely prepared. Because when that fire alarm goes off, or when you get the notice on your phone that the building is under lockdown and you weren't expecting it, guess what happens? You stop thinking. Okay? You stop thinking rationally. And you're only going to do what you have prepared yourself to do. John the Baptist is telling us that the Messiah is here now. And we must genuinely prepare our hearts for his coming. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And in honor of the reading of God's word, let's stand. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much, and we thank you for the reading of your perfect and infallible word in our midst this morning. God, we just ask that as you illumine the heart and mind of Matthew, uh, when you gave to him this, this, this perfect and infallible word, that you would illumine our hearts and minds this morning, and that you would cause us to truly prepare the way of the Lord in our own hearts. God, we love you with all of our soul. We trust you with all of our heart. We offer to you our love, our lives, and this prayer. In and through the name of our risen Lord and Master, our soon coming King, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. It is a day when we focus on preparation. Let me ask you all a question. What's the difference between an event Angie plans and an event I plan. Preparation. Preparation. I start planning week, maybe two days before, you know. Angie, if there's an event coming up, like, oh, I don't know, in the middle of the summer, she's already preparing for it. Okay? She's already preparing for it. You know, we had these people... Uh, someone mentioned that we should 
put our college students on our prayer list because they had finals coming up and 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 they would be traveling. See, for me, yes. If I were in college, you need to pray for me because I hadn't been getting ready for finals until now. Okay, and it's tomorrow. So you know, I, pray for me. And, and honestly, there's really no point. God's not going to help me. You know, just because I didn't apply myself, He's not going to uh, just magically give me knowledge that I didn't avail myself to get. The problem here, beloved, is that so many people that have contact with Christianity, and, and, and I'm not just saying people that are not inside the walls of a church. That is contact with Christianity. A lot of people that have contact with Christianity have somehow convinced themselves that they're going to be able to wait until the last few moments of their life. And that they're going to be able to pray some magical prayer. And that God is going to save them and bring them into the kingdom of heaven. When they have not prepared themselves to go into his kingdom. Can I tell you a secret, beloved? If you don't like worshiping down here now, heaven is going to be miserable for you. It's going to be absolutely miserable because heaven is all about worship. We heard the reading from Isaiah in our Advent candle lighting. And Isaiah is talking about events that to him were in the future. And Isaiah is calling his people to get themselves ready for the coming of this shoot from the uh, stump of Jesse. Matthew presents to us John the Baptist quoting this text from Isaiah. You know, I don't believe that either one of these men would be welcome in the average Christian church today. Both of them had a single-minded focus on serving God. Those kind of people make us nervous. We have a word for people like that. Fanatics. Or we say that they found religion. Or that they've gotten carried away with this thing. That they're taking it too far. They're letting it impact every area of their life. John is single-mindedly focused on proclaiming the coming of Messiah. Let me ask you a question. Y'all remember Luke 1, don't you? We're not going to put it up on the screen, but y'all remember Luke 1, don't you? Where this two old couple is given a son. And dad is struck mute. He can't talk because he wouldn't believe that God could do the same thing in his life that he did in Abraham's life. Hello? Hello? He had the Word of God. He was a priest. He knew the account of Abraham. He knew what God had done in Abraham's life. In fact, he is who he is, where he is, doing what he is, because God got involved supernaturally in in Abraham and Sarah's lives. And Zechariah didn't believe it. Now, let me ask you a question. Why was John born? Hello? John was born to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John understood fully why he had been born. John understood that so thoroughly that as he sat in Herod's jail, knowing that the end of his life was rapidly approaching, he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, Jesus, I've got to make sure. I've got to know. I've got to know that I know that I know that you are him. 
And y'all remember what Jesus sent back. He said, John, you already know. You already know. You've got the Scripture. Examine it for yourself. Is my life lining up with what Scripture says the Messiah should be like? And John says, well, I guess my head's going to a party and my body's going to remain right here. I'm okay with that. 10,000 years and then forevermore, John said. John was single-mindedly focused on, on, on Jesus. Isaiah we might tolerate a little bit more because Isaiah speaks about things in the future. Things in the future don't tend to disrupt our lives now. Right? How many of y'all know that you're going to have to pay income tax and you've been saving up for it so that you don't have to pay it all at once and, and then eat soup, beans, and taters for the rest of the month because you just paid your whole, uh, your whole paycheck to pay your taxes. See, things in the future don't tend to impact our lives. John, on the other hand, says it's here. It's now. The time for repentance is now. Now, we're going to talk about what genuine repentance is in a couple of hours. I'm kidding. Just barely. This Sunday marks the time when we are called to reflect on whether we have indeed understood the true importance and significance of Christmas. And so I want us to spend a few moments examining John's ministry and understanding that he calls us to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. And then he calls us to recognize that Christ the Messiah is coming. Verse 1. Matthew introduces us to John. If you want to know a little bit more about him, as I told you, you can look in Luke 1. But what I want to focus on is preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Now, you know, to us, wilderness is over in the national park, right? Do we go deep into the national park or into the national forest, and we're now in the wilderness? But this area that, that, that Matthew is talking about in Judea is very much like the Tri-Cities. Mohawk, Malsheim, and Midway. Okay. Very much like that, that there's these communities that are close by and they're separated by a little bit of distance. Do you understand what Matthew is telling us? These are country folk. These are country folk. These are, in Hebrew, the Am Ha'aretz, the people of the earth. These are people that God is first going to announce the gospel to. Now again, you know, the whole, the whole gospel narrative is one that upsets the way that we think things ought to be done. Where did the wise men go first? To the king. To the king, because that's where they expected. They expected the king to know where the next king had been born. They expected that the new king would have something to do with the temple, that he would be there. That that's where God would naturally begin to work out of. Out of the religious power structure that was existent at that time. But instead, God, listen, and I'm not being mean to the ladies, the only way that the angels could have announced the, the birth of Jesus to an, a more insignificant group of people is if the shepherds had been women, okay? Because women just weren't accepted that much in that culture. Their testimony couldn't even be admitted into court. And God chose to announce the most significant event in all of human history to the most insignificant people 
in the countryside. Now, I know babies tend not to come at, at convenient times of the day. You know, I, I mean, I know that some obstetricians will schedule the birth of a child. They want to make sure that they don't have to get up at night, that they don't have to leave home when it's dark. Babies have a tendency of coming when the Lord wants them to come. Amen. Two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. And God chose to break into the darkness of night and to announce that the light had come. Psalm 46.10 says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. You know what, what, what city folk, what the biggest thing they don't understand about us is? The pace of our life. Okay? They're always frenetically about doing something. Going here, going there, doing this, doing that. And they come to people like us and we just don't get wound real tight about stuff. And God is saying, cease striving. Be still, is what he's saying. Can we do that this Christmas? I mean, I understand this is one of the busiest times of the year for almost everybody in this room. But can we make a covenant with God that we're going to intentionally carve out time to be still and know that He is God and exalt Him among the nations and in the earth? Do you understand what Matthew is telling us? He's telling us that the gospel didn't begin in a synagogue. It didn't begin in the temple. It didn't begin in the church. And he's teaching us that God has a place for every believer to serve. John's was in the wilderness. Christ was in the cities and the towns and the synagogues as well as the countryside. We should witness and proclaim wherever we are in the wilderness or in the city. Verses 2 through 4. <coughs> First word of the gospel. Always. The first word of the gospel. Repent. Now, we tend to think that repentance is a feeling. Okay? Just the same way we think that love is a feeling. Bless your heart if you believe that love is a feeling and you're trying to use that feeling to hold together your relationship. I got bad news for you. It's not going to work. Okay? It can't work. Feelings change. All right? Commitments don't. A course of action does not change. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sin. Repentance is turning from our sin. It is an action word. It's not a passive word. Repentance is actively turning away from our sin and doing something tangible to demonstrate that we have turned away from sin. What did Peter say? What was the first word of the gospel out of Peter's mouth on the day of Pentecost? Repent. Then what? And be baptized for the remission of sin. Turn from your sin and then do something tangible to show that that, re that that repentance has taken place and is taking place. Repentance is not a feeling. It describes what coming to God is like. For example, if Angie were in town... And she called me and, and, and asked me a question. I would say, you just need to come on home and we'll deal with it. I would not say to her, you need to leave Greenville and come to Mohawk. Why? Because leaving Greenville is coming to Mohawk. You cannot come to Mohawk without leaving Greenville. You cannot leave sin 
if all of it is just feeling sorry. And honestly, beloved, at that point, it's just feeling sorry that you got caught. Okay? It's just feeling sorry that God is omniscient and caught you in your sin. The call to repentance is important and must not be neglected. Now listen to me, beloved. A lot of us have this notion that repentance is one of those one and dones, right? I mean, I, my family's favorite hymn. It was sung at my grandmother's funeral. It was sung at my papa's funeral. It's going to be sung at my funeral. Victory in Jesus. I love that hymn. But the chorus is wrong. It's wrong. Then I repented, past tense, of my sins. Y'all probably heard me changing a couple of words in, in, in one of the hymns we sang this morning. Because, listen to me, beloved, I'm not the one that overcomes. He is. Okay? He's the one that overcomes. If I overcome, it's because of Him. Then I am repenting of my sins and winning the victory is a more accurate way to put that chorus of that hymn. Because, listen to me, beloved, if I am walking away from here, is that not an ongoing action? If I have turned and begun walking away from my sin, if I have changed the course of my life, then what happens if I turn around and begin walking back? I am no longer in a state of repentance. I'm going back to the way things used to be. What happens if I just do the the Baptist thing? I stop and sit down on my blessed assurance and don't do anything else. I have stopped repenting. I have said enough. That I'm good. I I am comfortable with where I am. Surely God will have to let me in because of the state that I'm in right now. You see, we misinterpret John's message. We see this repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and we we translate that into English. You're a sinner, and you need to change. And certainly that's part of it. But let me tell you something I can't change. Only Jesus can change me. The main thrust of what John is saying is that the King is coming and you need to get ready for Him. And the way that you get ready for the King to come is to repent. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather walk away from something or walk towards something? Hello? When I teach young boys how to use a compass, we teach them on a circular course. And we tell them to take the bearing, to look up and look at whatever the compass is pointing at and run to it. Run to it. Now, what if that little boy was standing at flag A and the compass was telling him to go to flag D on the other side and he took his bearing and he turned around and ran backwards to D? It's not going to work. He's not going to get there. Because what he's doing then is walking away from something instead of walking towards something. And see, beloved, repentance is not just walking away from sin. It's walking toward Jesus. It is walking toward the one who died to provide release from our sin. The idea of preparing the way for the Lord is the idea of preparing our hearts. Preparing our hearts for Him to come. Now, I understand what's being said about Jesus here. This is important. In Isaiah 43, the way of Yahweh is prepared and made straight. Here, it is the way of Jesus. John and Matthew are both making explicit claims that Jesus is God in the flesh. 
verses 5 and 6. John's ministry is used by God. It's used by God. You know, here's the deal. These people that John has been called to minister to are good Southern Baptists. I mean, they're good Southern Jews. Okay? And when you talk about repentance and you talk about being baptized, you know what they're thinking about? Not them. They're thinking about the goyim, us, Gentiles. Yeah, them heathen Gentiles need to repent. And them heathen Gentiles, they need to be baptized. But listen, I'm good. You know, Jewish born and Jewish bred, and when I die, I'll be Jewish dead. That was their mindset. I am a child of Abraham. Therefore, I don't need to repent. All of that's been dealt with. I am a child of Abraham. That goat will pay the price for my sin today. And so for these people to come to John saying, I recognize what you're saying about Messiah and I need to do something to show the world that I understand your message. Verses 7 through 10. This is, by the way, beloved, this is not the way to win friends and influence people. Okay? Uh, generally, if, if, if in the middle of the sermon I look at somebody and call them a brood of vipers, they're probably not going to come forward during the invitation. Okay? I, I, I've just learned that over the years. And so these men come out. There's this big movement of God. I read an article this week that was talking about, you know, the, the hipster churches. Y'all know the ones I'm talking about. The pastor's there in skinny jeans. And, and he's got his shirt unbuttoned. He's not wearing a T-shirt. And you're going, ooh, that's nasty. Put a T-shirt on or, 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 or button that thing up. I, I don't need to see that. Okay? And they try to do all the hip, cool things. And guess what happens? Instead of the world becoming like the church, the church becomes like the world. The church becomes like the world. And pretty soon the church doesn't have a message to proclaim anymore. And so these guys come out. They sense that there's a movement of the people. Not a movement of God. A movement of the people is what they thought. And they come out and God is speaking to them through John. These are not John's words. These are God's words through John. You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Do you know why he said that? Listen, the Bible, the Old Testament, their Bible at the time told them to flee the wrath to come. They just didn't believe it. They didn't believe a word of it. And God is saying, how did, or through John, how did you wake up and understand what's happening? And so John says, I'll tell you what you do. If you're real about this, then you bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves that I have Abraham for my father. Because John is saying, you see that rock over there? God can make that a child of Abraham. And honestly, God can make that a child of Abraham easier than he can make you guys children of Abraham. See, John is saying that real repentance will show itself in life. It has to be a matter of living repentance, not just talking repentance. I know, we're almost out of time. Bottom line, repentance requires a change in conduct. There has to be a change in conduct to show that repentance has taken place. What is needed is what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 4.14. Where he said, wash your heart from evil, O Jerusalem, that you may be saved. How long will your wicked thoughts lodge within you? Verses 11 and 12, and we're done. John recognizes his own place before Jesus. He says, I'm not fit to remove his sandals. Listen, if I'm the disciple, 
or I'm the, the rabbi and y'all are the disciples. There are a lot of things that you would do for your rabbi, but taking his sandals off is considered too lowly for even the lowest of the rabbi's disciples. John says, I'm lower than low. I am not fit to remove his sandals. John recognizes his position in Jesus. And then he says that Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. This is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 37, 14. <coughs> I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life. Do you understand where you are right now if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God within you? You're dead. You're dead. Okay? That's the Old Testament testimony. It's the New Testament testimony. If you don't have the Spirit of God within you, you are dead. And God says, I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. And so, beloved, John's message was focused. He had one thing. The Messiah is coming, and we need to prepare the way. He is saying that Jesus is to be exalted. John exalted Jesus, not himself. The person whom God uses is the person who exalts Jesus. Let me say that again. The person whom God uses is the person who makes much of Jesus. And so as we prepare ourselves to celebrate our Lord's coming into this world, let us not forget that we don't just remember his past arrival into this world, but we also rejoice at his soon coming in glory when he will bring all of his children into his eternal kingdom of true peace and into his presence. And that, beloved, is how we prepare the way of the Lord.